This song always gets me a little bit choked up. I don't know about you, but it gets me a little choked up. Because people need the Lord. The state of the world today is the way it is because people need the Lord. If everybody in the world were Christians, it would be an incredibly wonderful place. Not sinless, for we are not sinless, but so much better. But that's not the reality. The fix to our problem is not politics, it's not economy, it's not socialism. It's certainly none of those things. The fix is Christ. When Christ is in the heart, we think differently, we act differently, we respond differently. We worry about the poor people and the homeless, but if Christians, if there were more people who were serious about the Lord, there would be less of that because more people would be helping them. So you can see just by that example alone how the world is influenced by the gospel. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, that was all free. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. This is our last message in the Ten Commandments. It's the Tenth Commandment. We're going to read verse 17 together. After that, I'll pray. Then we'll be seated. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. Let's read. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Father, the sins of the heart are the ones that are most difficult to deal with. The sins of the heart are often the ones that no one else sees until it manifests itself, and this is one of those sins. Help us today, Lord. Help me to preach. Help me to bring the, the ugliness, the dirtiness of covetousness before our eyes and give us understanding of what your word says about it, that we might know the dangers of it, that we might understand, Lord, the uh, the absolute disgust before your eyes, a holy God, of a sin, even a sin of this nature. Because this sin is never alone. It always manifests itself into other sins. Help us, Father, to know this truth, to live by it. Speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Covetousness is an enemy of the heart. In fact, we become covetous. When we become covetous, we begin to live, think about this, as if God does not provide for us. We begin to live as if we must begin to provide for ourselves. And that the other guy has something that we need. It fans covetousness, fans the flames of your carnal desires. and causes you to reach out for things that God says are off limits. Hebrews 13 verse 5 says this about covetousness. It says, let your conversation, the word conversation there is the idea of your lifestyle. It's an old English word. It doesn't mean just the words that we speak, though it certainly applies to that. But you could substitute the word lifestyle there if you wanted to, to help clarify it for yourself. But it basically says, let your lifestyle, your, your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. God is enough. If we believe that, truly live by that, we will struggle far less with covetousness. The opposite virtues of covetousness are contentment, reasonableness, modesty, self-control. Covetousness is a, a craving for personal or earthly benefit. To covet is to set your heart upon obtaining them at just about any cost. It is the act of focusing on the things of this life such as assets or popularity or power or personal appearance or setting your heart on expressly forbidden goals. As it says in the verse, thy neighbor's wife. You say, well, I don't want my neighbor's wife. I can see that even my neighbor doesn't really want his wife. But there are those that have a big problem with that. When we covet, we're focusing on materialism and not the Lord. 
We're beginning to desire the things that relate to this life. To desire money or clothing or a bigger home or a fancier car or a bigger, better job, more prestigious position in life. And many other things. The list goes on and on and on. In our covetousness, what happens to the Lord? He becomes relegated to second place. He is no longer the source of our provision. He is no longer the source of our satisfaction. Sure, we say we love the Lord. We come to church, punch in our spiritual time cards. But we don't exactly trust Him. At least not enough to satisfy our, our needs. And we believe that we must now somehow reach out and get our own provision and take, a, take care of ourselves. We've gone through the other nine commandments and all the other commandments, I don't know if you noticed or not, but all the other commandments are outwardly manifest. But covetousness may never actually be outwardly manifest. It may be happy just to sit and reside in the heart. It resides inwardly more often than outwardly in our actions. Covetousness, therefore, is an invisible sin. It is only when it's manifest that we see it, and usually when it's manifest, and I couldn't think of any other examples, but I'll just say usually, just in case you can come up with one. As far as I could see, just about every time covetousness is put into practice, it brings with it other sins. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. Notice this. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. The law came. Paul looked in his heart. And he saw the propensity to covet. Covetousness is a sin that has the capability to disguise itself so that a, covenant, a covetous person is barely even conscious of the sin himself. A good example of this is how you can go down to the store and you're walking through the store and you see something, right? You see something and you say to yourself, you say, well, that, that could be very useful. That could be useful. You don't buy it, you just take note that that could be useful. Like the other day, I saw a video clip of my grandson using a snowblower or a leaf blower. I don't know, are they the same thing? Not really, right? A leaf blower. Blowing leaves out of the yard, and I thought to myself, that could be useful. We begin by saying that could be useful. And in a few days, we have talked ourselves into understanding that it's not just something that could be useful, but it's necessary. I must have that leaf blower. Life ceases to exist if I don't get that leaf blower. Covetousness is dangerous because it's so very subtle. We don't really see it coming. We don't notice it coming. It is therefore possible to break this commandment and nobody will see it except God. And by His Word, He'll reveal it to you and you'll know. All commandments are more obvious when they're broken. Thou shalt not kill. Pretty obvious. Covetousness, not so much. This commandment goes straight to the heart and it deals with your desires. It's not so obvious. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. James chapter 1, sins of the heart. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then lust, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You can remember this process by the simple acronym LSD. Lust, sin, death. Some of you need to get your minds out of the gutter. You know too much about the world if you were thinking something else. There are several Bible words that are translated as covet or covetousness. In the Old Testament, we have the word betza, which means to plunder or to gain unjust profit. Then you have another word, hamad, 
which means to delight in, to have a great love for, some delectable thing, a lust for something. This is the Hebrew word that we find used in the Ten Commandments. Then you have another word, the word ava, which is another Hebrew word, which means to wish for something, to covet, greatly desire, be desirous, to long for, to lust after. These are words that the Old Testament uses for this idea of covetousness. The one that I find most painful is greatly desire. Strongly wanting something. Keep in mind that these are things that God has put off limits to you. They don't belong to you. They never have, they never did, and probably never will. And you shouldn't desire the things that God has put off limits. In the New Testament, we have a couple of words. One of the words is found in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, if you turn there. It's the word pleonexia. I know you're going to remember all of this, right? You can look at my notes online if you want, or you can watch the video once it finally gets posted on YouTube. Plenexia, it's the idea of avarice, extortion, an insatiable desire. Insatiable means it cannot be satisfied. Luke chapter 12, verse 15, this is where the word is used. And he said unto them, take heed and beware of this covetousness, this insatiable desire. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Your life is not about what you own. We do this. And I think probably if we would be honest with ourselves, all of us do this. You see a man who is clearly a beggar, a, a poor man. And then you see a rich man. You know as well as I do, you look at them differently. If the poor man, maybe he's homeless and hasn't had a shower in a few weeks, you know as well as I do, you would much rather be with one as versus the other, but God doesn't think in those terms. He sees the soul. The other word is the word philargurus. This is an interesting word. It's a compound word. It comes from two words, philos. Does anybody know what philos means? We also use it for Philadelphia. Love, brotherly love, all right? It's often expressed as being brotherly love. And then arguros. Does anybody know that word? It's the word gold or silver. I'm sorry, silver. So the word literally means to love silver. The love of money. And it's never used in a good sense in the Bible. Luke chapter 16, verses 13 through 15. No servant can serve two masters. Luke 16, verses 13 through 15. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also, who were what? Covetous. Heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. The Lord particularly hates covetousness because covetousness is manifest as an act of worship. An appropriate term for the powerful longings for material things that involves that kind of dependence of the soul. As though we would be miserable or somehow less able to live without it. That defines worship pretty well. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. You ever notice where the Bible says covetousness, which is idolatry? You get it now, right? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. But they that will be rich... Now, it doesn't say, but they that are rich. I want to make that note. It's not they that are rich, but they that will be rich. In other words, they have a desire, a will to be rich. But they that will be rich fall into a temptation and a snare and to many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows." Your love of money, your covetousness is going to bring you destruction, perdition, 
it will cause you to be pierced through with many sorrows. Earlier I mentioned this verse, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Mortify. If you were in Sunday school this morning, what does the word mortify mean? Kill, Kill it. This is not something you live with. This is not something you tolerate. This is not even something you seek to control. The only way to deal with this properly and biblically is to kill it. What do we kill? Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, kill it. Uncleanness, kill it. Inordinate affection, kill it. Evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. You can't coexist with covetousness. You can't control covetousness. You must kill it. Certain people are more prone to certain sins than others. I've never really been a covetous person unless I see a Corvette. There's the weakness. There it is. I've never really coveted other things in that way. But my, my father, he loves big houses. And I went to visit him one time. He, lived, he lives in Charleston, South Carolina. And there's a place that he works down there out on an island where uh, there's a big resort where lots of rich people have bought their houses. And so he wanted to take me for a drive and show me all the big houses. And I was like, okay, you know, whatever. Spend time with dad. Go out and see the houses. So we're out there. We're driving around. And he, he points at one house. And he says, you see that house? I mean, it was like this big, glorious mansion kind of thing. Probably a better mansion than I could imagine. And he points at it and he says, that house belongs to Eddie Rabbit. Anybody know who Eddie Rabbit is? Yeah. So he was a musician back when, you know, I was younger, back when the wheel was still square. Okay? Eddie Rabbit, big musician, uh, sang a song called I Love a Rainy Night. You can hear it in the elevators sometimes now. But made lots of money off of, you know, one or two big hits and bought himself a mansion out there. My dad was just in awe. I was like, yeah, okay, you know, that's not one of my big deals. Houses don't throw me one way or the other. But covetousness manifests itself in so many ways, and you're going to see that as we go through this. I first want to give you three marks of covetousness. Then after I give you these three marks of covetousness, then we're going to look at three examples of covetousness from the Bible. Then after that, we're going to talk about the three effects of covetousness and then wrap it up with three cures. Three, 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 three. I didn't notice that until later on this week, but that's kind of interesting the way that falls out. So let's start with the three marks of covetousness. Three marks. Sometimes we wonder, what's the difference? If you ever wondered, what's the difference between covetousness and a simple desire to buy something that you don't have? After all, we do desire things. We all do. And what makes it right or wrong? I mean, the desire for marriage. Desiring better jobs. The Bible even says if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire a good thing. So what makes the difference between covetousness and just simply wanting something that maybe you really do need? Sometimes, however, we get all confused in our motives we were talking about. Sometimes we may do something that in and of itself is not wrong, but we do it for the wrong motive. So, for example, we'll marry because we think that we're going to be happy. I'm not happy now, so I need to get married. Um, you're going to find that marriage is a wonderful, wonderful thing, but it can also be a challenge. If you're looking for it to make you happy, however, you need to look to Christ. All right? There will be days when somebody is not going to be happy. And everybody knows the rules. If mama's not happy, nobody's happy. Right? Sometimes we marry because we want to be happy. Or we desire a better job simply because we love money. And we think that it's going to give us more freedom to do more things or we want fame or we want influence. Covetousness is a characteristic of the times in which we live. This is the way most people think today. This is what we're taught to be the key to success. Go to a big college, get a big degree with a big name on it, get a big job so you can buy a big house, drive a big car. And marry somebody that you can treat as if they're a trophy and not a person that is actually one with you, as the Bible says. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says this. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And then it tells us what men will be like. Get this. 
For men shall be lovers of their own selves. What's the next word? Covetous. We're living in a day that the Bible describes as perilous times. Men certainly do love themselves. And men certainly are covetous. And the list goes on. I'll let you read it in your own time. It's like six or seven verses long. The day in which we live. We're living now in what I like to see as a doctrinally perilous time. When many who claim to be Bible believers are actually forsaking the principles of faith and embracing worldliness and error and immorality. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, turn on some of these televangelists someday. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. These money-loving preachers and their media are not proof of this. I don't know what is. Because that's the day in which we live. According to the Bible, a man who is covetous is unqualified for the pastorate. Did you know that? 1 Timothy chapter 3 says this. Enlisting the qualifications of a pastor. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 3. Not given to wine, no striker, not, get, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Twice, qualifications of a pastor. If money is a big deal to you, you're not qualified. Get rid of that, talk to me later. But as goes the preacher, and this is true in every church, we like to come up with exceptions and say, well, it's not really that true, but it's true in every church. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I know that Jesus is the head of the body of the church. I understand that. So don't shout out, you know, Jesus to me when I ask you this question I'm about to ask. I, I understand Christ is the head of the church. But who leads this church? Well, I do. I'm the pastor. It's part of my job description. It says pastor leading the church onto God's agenda. That's the rest of that statement I like to add. So that I am leading the church to do what God wants the church to do. Right? So what does that mean? That means that typically speaking, the church follows the lead of the pastor. And if the, if the pastor is preaching that kind of message, and he's kind of one of those kind of guys that only cares about that, as goes the preacher, so goes the church. When the church allows its people to live in a self-seeking, leisure-loving, worldly way, materialism becomes an idol in the church, Christ is no longer leading the church because the under-shepherd didn't do his job. That's why the pastor is not allowed to be a covetous man. As goes the preacher, so goes the church. When believers are flattered from the pulpit, and this happens all the time, you get some guy with a little bit of power and authority come in, and everybody's like, oh, I want to know you. Oh, What's your name? Oh, let's go out and have dinner together. Let's have some fellowship. You lying dog, you don't really want fellowship. You just want to have a trophy in your contacts. I know this big important guy. When we flatter from the pulpit, we flatter people into thinking that they're still loyal disciples of Christ when they're walking in covetousness, the bar of God's holy standard is lowered. And I got to tell you, my standard my standard is not as high as God's. It's supposed to be, and I try to keep it that way, but I notice sometimes in my own life I struggle with some things, so I know, being human, that my standards are not as high as God's, but from the pulpit, we don't get an option. When I preached on the Ten Commandments, there were times when I didn't want to preach on that one. Why? Because there's a spiritual aspect to every one of those. Sometimes we fail, don't we? Nowadays, it's become a guaranteed way of building a reasonably large congregation in many parts of the world. You know, if you can get, you know, some important famous person to come to your church, what happens? Everybody goes to church to see an important famous person. You grow, right? But what does Christ say? Revelation chapter 3, verse 16, he looks at his church and he says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Why? Because you're not hot, you're not cold, you're lukewarm. Why are you lukewarm? Because you said, I am rich and increased with goods. 
and you didn't know that you were poor and blind and naked, Jesus says, I counsel you to go buy eye salve so that you can see. He says, you're neither cold, you're neither cold or hot, you're lukewarm. And that is the state of much of Christianity today. Lukewarm. I wish you were cold. I wish you were hot, but you're not. You're lukewarm. And I spew thee out of my mouth. All right? Covetousness is a problem. So how can we identify it? Because you said, Pastor, that sometimes we can be covetous and not even realize we're being covetous. So how do I see it? All right? Let me give you three things here. Three things that will help you identify this subtle sin of covetousness. First of all, when you strive for earthly things more than you strive for spiritual things. That's a good indication that you're covetous. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, with a show of hands, how many of you are risen with Christ? Yeah, it's the idea of being saved. If you are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Are your life's goals for that which is spiritual? If I were to walk up to you, probably not today after preaching this, but at any other time when you're not thinking about this, if I were to walk up to you and say, what's your life goal? What would be your answer? Well, five years from now, I'm, I'm hoping that I'll be the CEO of Microsoft. Or, you know, whatever your goal may be. Are you going to give me some earthly goal? Or are you going to say, well, five years from now, I hope that my walk with the Lord is a little better. I hope I'm closer to Christ than I am now. What is it that you're really focused on? A covetous person has no time in their thoughts and their actions for God because they're busy trying to get the things of the world. A covetous person will do whatever he deems necessary to get what he wants out of life. Hosea chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. It's a very interesting passage, and I want you to notice how covetousness plays into this. But notice this. Hosea chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. He is a merchant. The balances of deceit are in his hand. He loveth to oppress. And Ephraim said, Yet I am become rich. I have found me out substance in all my labors. They shall find none iniquity in me that were sin. Really? Really? In other words, according to this passage, there were those who were unjust businessmen. Why? The love of money is the root of all evil. So if you're not going to find anything wrong with my business practices, I do it by the book. I follow the law. And everybody in this room knows that there are times when unethical things happen in the name of making more money and you can't do a thing about it because it's not strictly illegal. Boy, I hate that. When I was a young Christian, my wife and I, we, we moved from uh, one place to another and we needed to go buy, uh, buy some furniture for our living room. And so uh, we, we went down to this place and listen, these furniture stores that say, uh, take it home today and pay for it six months from now, don't do it. All right, don't sit on the floor if you have to, but don't do it. But I did because I was dumb and I didn't have anyone telling me don't do it. So I did, and uh, sure enough, six months later, rolled around, they started taking the pay out of my paycheck, just like they were supposed to, and, and so the pay started going out, and then I went down to stop the pay at the end when I was supposed to stop the pay, and they stopped the pay, but they didn't. They accidentally, or something happened, and they ended up sending one more payment, $75, went back to this place. By that time, I was no longer even in the States. I was back living in Korea again. I contacted this place, and I said, hey, you got $75 too much of my money. He said, oh, that's all electronic. We can't do anything about that. Boy, it was unethical. So I went to the Air Force. I said, hey, we sent $75 too much of that money. I want to get that money back. You got to understand, these are the days before computers and before internet and all of that, okay? And they said, well, we really can't do that. Once it goes out, it goes out. We can't pull money back from other people. I said, man, good night. These guys just stole $75 of my money and there's nothing I can do about it because it's not illegal. 
Unethical? Yes. Illegal? No. What about us? What kind of actions are we doing? Well, it's not strictly illegal. It's not, the Bible doesn't say this is wrong. You ever heard anybody say that? You hear it all the time. Yeah, maybe the Bible doesn't say chapter and verse that what you're doing is wrong, but very clearly your actions are showing that you've got covetousness in your heart and you're trying to get the world's blessings for yourself instead of trusting on the Lord to provide. Number two, when you enjoy earthly things more than spiritual things. We read Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Look at verse 2. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Set your affections on things above. Set your affection on things above. In other words, in your heart, purpose to love spiritual things. Not on things on the earth. That's what it says. Don't answer this. Well, answer it to yourself, but don't answer it out loud. What would you really like to do this morning? Would you like to go to church, sing praises to the King of Kings, or maybe go to the park and go for a walk and sniff the flowers and look at the pretty water, or maybe make a little bit more money, you know, maybe get a little side job or something going on there. Well, i got to go to church or people don't think I'm a good Christian, so I'll go to church, but I would much rather do something else. Would you rather be in fellowship with the saints of God or would you rather go fishing with your work buddies? Because after all, they bragged about it and the place they're going, you can catch some pretty good fish there. Now, I don't eat fish, so that would never be a temptation to me. But some people struggle with things like that. Why? Well... Because they haven't set their affection on things above. What have you set your heart on? It's a good indication of covetousness when you're focused on earthly things and you want that more than you want spiritual things. You say, but I want spiritual things, Pastor, and I believe everybody in this room does. But how much? That's the question. What's number one in your life? Is it God or something else? Turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Here was Jesus' answer for the problem. Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Now get this last verse. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So what things in your life do you value? What is it that you value the most in your life? If you're married, out of the context of this, if I asked you this question, say, two weeks ago, you might have said, well, my wife, my family, or my children, or my husband, or whatever. And sometimes we'll point to these things that are earthly things and we say, I value that. I understand that. I value my family too. But I'll never forget the day when I learned this truth. And it wasn't long after that, after knowing this truth, that my wife asked me a, a question I was seriously afraid to answer. She wanted to do something and I had to do my devotions first. And she said to me, who do you love more, me or God? And she was a baby in Christ too, so don't think too unkindly of her. I was afraid to answer because I knew what the right answer was supposed to be. And I knew she wasn't going to like it. So I very boldly said, God. To which she said, that hurts. I said, but honey, you've you got to understand, if, if I love God more than anything else, I'll be a better husband. I'll be a better father. I'll be a better person. And you can love me more. Okay, that works. <laughs> if it makes you better, it makes me better. We're all better. Amen. God has to be first. Number three. When our conversations, and now I'm talking about our words, our tongue. When our conversations are about earthly things more than spiritual things. You know, one of the things that thrills me about picking up you guys and bringing you to church and taking you home. The conversations. 
Because they go spiritual, and then somebody will say something dumb or funny, and we'll do that for a couple minutes. And then back to spiritual, and then something else. And then we'll Bible, and debate theology, and all of this happens. Why? Because we love the Lord. That's why. And what's inside of your heart is coming out of your mouth. You ever get around those people and all they talk about it comes out of their mouth is nothing but complaining or bitterness or, you know, the love of the world. And, and, you know, you spend a couple hours with them and you're tired. You're worn out. You can't wait to get away from them because it's drawn you to drug you down. John chapter 3, verse 31. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly. And speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. So what, what kind of things do you talk about? So, well, you know, Pastor, the guys I work with, they're not Christians. And, you know, we, I can't really talk about biblical things. Why not? That's how they're going to learn about the Lord and get saved. I understand you probably aren't going to discuss the hypostatic union or anything like that. But you could tell them how much Jesus loves you. What's wrong with that? If it's really in you, let it come out. <clears throat> Pastor, I tried that. It doesn't go too well. And most of the time I just sit around saying nothing. I get it. I understand. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Ammo Troop, 20 years and two days. I know what it's like. I really do. I understand. I've been up. I've been down. I've been everywhere in between. I get it. But I do know what God wants. And what God wants is for us to fill our hearts and our minds with Him. With Him. Luke chapter 6, verse 45. You can say you're focused on spiritual things all you want, but you can't hide what's in your heart because it's going to come out of your mouth. Luke 6, verse 45. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of his heart his mouth speaketh. The abundance of your heart. So if you've got a lot of Bible in you, that's going to come out. That's just the way that works. And this is not something that is a maybe. This is something that Jesus said is going to happen. And it's going to happen. If your speech is all about the things of this world, chances are real good that you're covetous for the things of this world. Now let me give you three Bible examples of covetousness. First of all, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 19. We won't read all of that. I want you to focus on verses 5 and 6. You know the story, the story of the garden, Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, the lie of the devil. Verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was what? Good for food. Really? God says it's not good for food. Don't eat it. But she said it's good for food. Pleasant to the eyes. And get this. A tree to be desired to make one wise. He shall be as God's knowing good and evil. Just eat this. She took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Why? Why did she do that? Because the woman desired to be as God's. To know good and evil. But the sad fact is she already knew good. What was she going to learn then? evil that was the only thing she could possibly gain then she saw the fruit as something to be desired she coveted after the fruit something that god specifically forbid he prohibited it it was off limits covetousness always goes for that which is off limits adam and eve i want you to think about this now think about the ten commandments for a moment Adam and Eve violated the first commandment because they put the will of self or the will of Satan before God. Then they violated the sixth commandment because their actions kill us all. Wow. Covetousness truly does not come alone, does it? Covetousness is usually accompanied by other sins. And I only say usually just in case you can think of something, but I couldn't. Number two. A second example, go to Joshua chapter 6. We're going to read verses 
18 and 19 here. Joshua chapter 6, verses 18 and 19. Children of Israel go into the promised land. They come to the city of Jericho and God gives them specific instructions on how to conquer Jericho and what to do once they get in there. Starting in verse 18, And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when ye take of the accursed thing, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and the vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So God's told them when you go into Jericho, kill everybody, but take the gold and the silver and all of that stuff, and that goes into the treasury of the house of the Lord. That's where that goes. It belonged to him. Skip over to chapter 7. And I'll bear you the long story, but the children of Israel lost the battle as a result of a man named Achan who took some gold and silver and a Babylonian garment and he hid it in his tent, hid it under the floor of his tent. And then he got found out. When he found out, Joshua asked him some questions and he gave some answers. Now notice this, starting in verse 20, Joshua 7 and verse 20. And Achan answered Joshua. Joshua basically said, why'd you do this? What's going on? And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them. When I saw, then I coveted and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Now, God specifically forbade them to take anything for themselves. In fact, all the gold and the silver was supposed to belong to the Lord in the Lord's treasury. But Achan saw it and he coveted it and he took it and he hid it. A covetous person, they don't want other people to know that they're covetous, do they? Not a Christian specifically. They don't want others to see the sinful fruit of their covetousness. And so Achan hid his sin in his tent. I wonder how many sins we hide at home. You ever wonder that? Where nobody else can see it except us, right? Covetousness. It led Achan to violate the first three commandments because he put the gold and the silver before God. The eighth commandment because he stole what God said was his and belonged in the treasury. And the ninth commandment, because he hid it in his tent and he pretended that all was well. Covetousness never comes alone. And this last commandment, because he wanted what belonged to God so badly that he would do whatever it took to get it. Covetousness was accompanied by several other sins. Third example, David and Bathsheba. Everybody knows the story. David and Bathsheba, David's up on the rooftop and he spies Bathsheba down uh, in her backyard, I imagine, washing. And David was the king of Israel. Could have had anything he wanted. You can find the story in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Could have had anything he wanted. But what he wanted, in this case, was something that was not his to have. What he wanted was off limits. And aside from this, David was already married. Think about this. Back in 1 Samuel chapter 18, he marries Michal, which is Saul's daughter. Now, I understand Michal wasn't exactly a prize wife, if you know what I mean. But the fact is, he was married, and that's that. Now, I don't know what you think about your spouse. You might look over at your husband or your wife and think, yeah, I could have made a better choice. Maybe you could have, but you didn't. And you're in it now. If you're single, you just remember that, okay? You don't want to be, could have made a better choice. I get so thrilled when my wife tells me that I'm the most wonderful husband in the world. It happens a lot. <laughs> but sometimes it happens, it doesn't happen. <laughs> and other things come out of her mouth. But it's thrilling to know when you're right. But on this night, David's not right. He coveted after Bathsheba and he took her. 
And when he did, his covetousness led him to violate the sixth commandment, murder, because he killed her husband to hide his sin. The seventh commandment, adultery, which is what he committed with Bathsheba. The eighth commandment, because he stole somebody else's wife. The ninth commandment, lying. You said, wait a minute, did David lie about it? Oh, yeah. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 12 says this. When Nathan went to confront him, 2 Samuel 12, verse 12, For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the Son. David did it all secretly. Tried to hide his sin. A whole year goes by, the child is even born, and he thinks nobody knows, and maybe nobody knew. And God told Nathan. I don't know how that all worked out, but somehow Nathan found out and he came to David. He carried on for a whole year pretending to be right with God. But he wasn't. In essence, he was lying about the whole situation. And David violated this last commandment because he coveted another man's wife. Covetousness never comes alone. You can be sure that if your heart is covetous, when it's manifest, it's going to manifest itself in other sins as well. Three effects of covetousness. Let's do these. I'm already out of time, so I'm going to try to do this as quickly as possible, meaning we'll be here another 30 minutes. But um, number one, covetousness takes over the heart. It doesn't just abide with other things. It completely takes over the heart. Matthew 13, verse 22. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. When you allow the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches to come into your life, it's going to choke the word. Now, child of God, I know if you're a child of God and you're saved by God's grace, don't think you can escape this principle. You won't. I'm not saying you're going to lose your salvation or anything like that. What I am saying is you cannot possibly focus on this world's goods and God at the same time. No man can serve two masters. He'll either love the one and hate the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot serve God and mammon. It just can't be done. Covetousness takes over the heart. Gives place to the heart, a place for materialism, on the throne of your heart where God's supposed to sit. And as soon as we give our minds and our imagination to dreaming about material objectives, Spiritual matters no longer become important to us. They're no longer interesting. Number two, covetousness affects our love for other people, our love for our fellow man. Covetousness takes the believer's eyes off of the well-being of the neighbor and focuses on our neighbor's possessions and advantages as if somehow we can get satisfaction from having it. That's why that command says, not your neighbor's animals, not your neighbor's stuff, not your neighbor's wife. And you know good as, well, good as well as I do that if somebody came in and took your wife, you would not be happy. Some people might be, I don't know, but I wouldn't be. Why? Why would somebody do something like that? Because you don't really care about your neighbor. You only care about getting what you want. Because that's what covetousness does for you. Number three, covetousness is addictive and progressive. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 10, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. Wow, what a verse. Take the time to read through Ecclesiastes chapter 2 sometime. Solomon tried everything and at the, end of the, uh, at the end of it all, he said, it's all vanity. It was empty. What did he learn? Solomon learned that the poor man wants money and the rich man wants money too. But he that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is vanity! That's what he learned. Solomon should have known no matter how hard he tries, he won't find satisfaction. He should have known that. I mean, he was the wisest guy on the face of the whole earth. If anybody should have known it, it should have been him. God talked to Solomon in his dreams when he was young. Then he started wanting things. 
Read Ecclesiastes chapter 2 sometimes. You're going to find that out. He came up empty-handed because he comes to the end of himself and finds out that the only thing that ever really satisfies is a relationship with the Lord. That's it. Now let me give you the three cures for covetousness. Three cures. Number one, maintain spiritual priorities. Never allow yourself to get material priorities. It doesn't go on your list. Your list is very short. Number one, God. Number two, there ain't one. Maintain spiritual priorities. Everything else will fall in line. God promised us that. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So get your eyes on the Lord, not also, but the Lord alone. And everything else falls right in line. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. They murmured. They complained. They were discontent. They longed for material benefits. They even, a couple of points, they, they want to even go back to Egypt because they remembered the leeks and the garlics. You don't remember the, the whip from the, from the, from the Pharaoh or, and from the, from the taskmasters on your back? You don't remember that? You don't remember the bricks that you had to make out of mud and they, they wouldn't even let you use straw. You don't remember the slavery and the abuse. You don't remember that. All you can think about is food. You foodies got problems, I'm going to tell you. Moving on. Number two, mortify your covetous desires. The greatest weapon against covetousness, and it's mentioned in so many texts, is the act of killing it. Mortification. Putting it to death. That's something that I think we can understand. We can understand death, right? Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Ephesians 4, verse 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt. Put him off. You made a choice to put him on. You make a choice to put him off. He's corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Then in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, Flee also youthful lust, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Run. Run as if your life depends on it from the love of the things of this world. Run. Because you can't control it. Covetousness is an impending disaster. It'll bring ruin to your life. Number three, manage your thought life. To resist covetousness, you have to do something about controlling your thought life. Because remember, it's the invisible sin. It starts in the heart. You've got to control that. Romans 12, 1 and 2, very familiar verses. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. mind. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know why you struggle sometimes to know the will of God for your life? There would be a couple of big problems. First of all, you're looking way down in the future and God's not ready to show you that yet. He'd probably scare you half to death if he did. But you can't even figure today out. His word is pretty clear. Do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. But you can't even figure that out. You don't know what the perfect and acceptable will of God is for your life because your mind is not focused on Christ. It's filled with other things. And I, I don't know how to tell you this, but kings don't share their thrones. And if Jesus is going to be the king in your heart, he's not going to want to share his throne with covetousness. So here's a conclusion. Psalm 119, verse 96. And I want to use this as a conclusion to the whole series. 
The Ten Commandments are God's perfect moral code. It's suited for all men of all times and in all circumstances. They're based on the principles of redemption and they indicate man has a twofold relationship with God and with those around him and that his actions proceed from his heart. And that when he knows that something is wrong, he should also know that there is a right action that should be taken as well. We've gone through this through the Ten Commandments. Now look at this verse, Psalm 119, verse 96. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. We could have read through the Ten Commandments a hundred times over in the same amount of time, but they're so exceeding broad. We need to apply them to our lives. Let's all stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Jesus had a man come to him as a rich young ruler. And he said, What must I do that I may inherit eternal life? As if. You know, is this something he was going to inherit? How do I get my inheritance? Well, first of all, you've got to be a child. And he wasn't. And Jesus said, how about the commandments? Did you keep the commandments? And he names off some commandments, and the rich young ruler says, yeah, I kept all those. I'm good there. And Jesus says, one thing thou lackest. One thing thou lackest. Four simple words which reveals the heart of every one of us. As the piano begins to play, one thing thou lackest, if God has spoken to your heart about anything this morning, won't you come? One thing thou lackest. So I want you to take everything that you have, I want you to sell it, liquefy it, take all that money and give it to the poor, then come and follow me. The Bible says that that young rich man went away, he went away grieved because he had so much. And he couldn't give it up. He couldn't give up this world's goods to follow Christ. How many of us could fall into that category? Maybe your thing is not really covetousness. Maybe it was one of the other commandments. And it keeps giving you problems. I shall not steal. I shall not bear false witness. I shall not commit adultery. Whatever it is, thou shalt have no other God before me. Whatever it is, if the Lord has spoken to you, would you deal with it this morning? What's your goals for life? If it's anything other than having a closer walk,